In 2006, British troops were sent to Helmand Province, Afghanistan, where they would fight some of their toughest battles for over 50 years. Jesus Christ! I was... A year later, I joined them to tell their story. Get down, get down, get down, get down. Get down. The men and women who risked all on Britain's front line. Enemy! That was a hit with the SPG. It just hit the compound right there. Man down! down! Man down! Since then, hundreds of British lives have been lost fighting the Taliban, extreme fundamentalists who aided Al Qaeda and are responsible for supplying the world with a large amount of its opium. Now I'm back with British forces on the 10th anniversary of NATO's deployment. I'll be spending time with Whiskey Company 4-5 Commando to see how our troops are coping in one of the most war-torn countries in the world and to see what has changed since I was last here. I will also be spending time with the Americans. There's an explosion just there right now, yeah? Yeah, that was probably an IDE. Now the most dominant force in Helmand since their surge in 2010. He's in the compound. And I witnessed firsthand how the Afghan National Army are fighting a determined Taliban. These men will ultimately be the ones defending Afghanistan when ISAF combat troops leave in 2014. since the tragic events of 9-11 thrust the West into the war on terror. Of course, the American and British troops to arrive here in Afghanistan. Their objective was to remove Al-Qaeda, its training grounds, and its leader, Osama bin Laden. But they're also tasked with ousting the Taliban regime and trying to install a democratic system. Now I've come back to find out what actually has been achieved in the last decade if the sacrifices made have been worth it, and if it's realistic to believe that the Afghan people can protect and maintain a democracy when NATO troops cease combat operations at the end of 2014. It's been two and a half years since I last set foot on Afghan soil. Over the five years we've been making these programs, this place has become an important part of my life. Leaving the Chinook, my emotions run between apprehension and excitement as the extreme heat hits me. In 2010, things changed significantly in Helmand. British forces handed over established bases in Gamsur, Kajaki, Sangin, Musakala, and Nauzad to the Americans, who then, in a move known as the Surge, flooded the north with 20,000 soldiers. British troops were now to concentrate their efforts in central Helmand. The plan was to saturate the area and silence the Taliban. I'm heading to patrol base Katina in Nadali South. To get there, I'm traveling in a ridgeback with Whiskey Company 4-5 Commando. They are part of the 8,000 British contingent who have gone from patrolling an area half the size of England to one the size of Kent. We're only about uh, a kilometre an hour away from uh, Katina. And, you know, this is 
proper agricultural um, green zone, uh, but it's also a great place if you're an insurgent to hide out and also to fight because there's lots of cover and there are lots of irrigation ditches to use as firing points. Katina is home to Whiskey Company, whose area of operation is a vital 32 square kilometers set within farming communities. If peace and stability can be achieved here, then it's a potential template for the rest of Helmand. This will be my home for the next few weeks as I spend time on the front line. So show me around, mate. Give me yeah, the tour. What do you see around here? Company Sergeant Major Spot Watson gives me the grand tour. But just down here is all the accommodations, all these tents here is where all the, all the lads live. That's where the, the chef prepares his stuff. All they do is come along here, just grab the plate, grab the food, and move into the galley and sit down and eat it. So army terminology, right? Yeah, no scoffing there, it's only scran. Only scran, right. Uh, wets, not bruise. Got it. So, Ross, so this is the wreck area here. Um, there's a gym here there. Keep themselves ticking over, keep them fit, and unwind from patrols and sort of totally switch off from that side of it. Just so, you know, it gives them a bit of a break, really. Well, it takes your brain out of that area, out yeah. of that zone. Yeah. yeah. Boom! Four months ago, these lads were training in Scotland under very different conditions. I spent time with them as they prepared for their deployment to Afghanistan. No small feat when you're as old as I am. Go on, Rob, go on! Begin! Get on the deck, lads! Keep walking hard on the tires, lads! Go! Three, two, one, go! Fortunately enough for me, there wasn't someone my weight to compare me with. I'm joking. Uh, this looks like, you know, it is a bit of fun at the end of a long run and some fears, but you don't have to be a genius to work out how important this might be to you if you're the person being carried and you've just been injured. So, though it's a bit of a laugh at the end and it's also a good fizz, unfortunately, this has a very, very serious side to it. Some of these young Marines are old hands, but for others, this will be their first tour. Some of you guys have been out before, yeah? Yeah. How many? You two? Yeah. The rest of you? No, no, first time. Does anything prepare you for someone shooting at you? Not really. Your training does your drills, but there's always that pause when you first get shot at. You're like, am I getting shot at? What's this about? Yeah, I'm getting shot at. Quick, get down, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Then what do you think about that, guys? Are you thinking about that moment? Absolutely. I think you'd be mad yeah. not to process some of those thoughts, you know? If you also discuss the way that the, uh, the percentages work, um, and unfortunately I've, I've witnessed it, um, some people might not come back from this tour. This is a hard yeah. question to ask, but if something happened to the, the man next to me, yeah. how would you feel about that? Um, well, I can relate it. Like, my mother died. And I watched her dying, you know, I, I, I watched it, an evolution of it. So I, I think I have a grasp on life and death and the coming and going. It's, it, it, it's just the way things are. And sometimes you just have to take that hit. I mean, is it as simple as saying, you know, that's my job, that's what I'm trying to do, that's what I'm going to do? Is it that simple or is there something else inside you that makes you want to be here and want to go out to that place? We are brothers in arms. We're out fighting, doing what we got to do, 24-7 with each other, eating, sleeping. You know, doing the job and loving it. It's called the Fighting 45th. You know, doesn't get a reputation or name like that for no reason. Do you see yourself then as following the orders that you're given rather than being there for any kind of political motive, personally? Um, a bit of both, to be honest. Like, 
to, to be a part of the West, you know, you get a mortgage, you get a bank loan, you're a part of the system. And people have given me grief for, for joining up and, you know, wanting to go to war and this kind of thing. But again, I just keep telling them that they're a part of what I'm defending. If, if we didn't do it, they wouldn't have these freedoms. And it's, it's, it's that simple and they, they, they can like it or lump it, I don't care, you know, we, we just do what we have to do, you know. The Royal Marines are the amphibious commando force of the Royal Navy. The Corps, as it's known, dates back nearly 350 years. With the commando role coming into effect during the Second World War, when Churchill demanded he had raiding forces. Well done, every single one of you. Superb. These highly trained troops are skilled in all types of warfare, from Arctic to desert conditions. Their ability to adapt and innovate has given the Royal Marine Commando a worldwide reputation. Would you bow your heads for the 4-5 Commando blessing? And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, 4-5 Commando, and all your loved ones, this day and forevermore. Amen. 4-5 Commando, the chaplain has just blessed the most awesome and arresting sight. It is a sight that I adore, a band of brothers, the most special club. We will give those who seek to oppose us an honourable way to become part of the legitimacy of Afghanistan. But if they refuse that and become irreconcilable, we will fight them hard and ruthlessly, as 4-5 Commando always does. And we must look after the people who have known nothing other than war and oppression in their lives to date. It is about Afghans before it is about anybody else, ourselves included. We must, and we will, I know deep in my heart, get this right. I wish you good luck, Godspeed, and I will stand at your shoulder throughout. I'm back in Afghanistan with 4-5 Commando. Since I was last here, there's been a significant change in tactics, due in part to state-of-the-art surveillance systems. This 24-hour eyes-on approach is having a direct effect on the Taliban and increasing security for the people here. The officer in charge of Whiskey Company, Major Paul Maynard, wanted to explain some of the new tactics being adopted in Nad Ali. The enemy now has a face. The concentration of force means that we're living amongst them, uh, and our focus is on trying to understand them. And I think that's the critical lesson that's been learned and relearned. In order to defeat the insurgent, first of all, you've got to understand them. In order to understand the insurgency's modus operandi, Whiskey Company has its own investigation team. These men are responsible for analyzing surveillance and intelligence reports. One of the lessons from counterinsurgency campaigns is the importance of intelligence. And in this room, uh, essentially, is the, uh, is the hub uh, within Whiskey Company where it all takes place. The green, white, and red boards that you can see around you. Mm. Uh, you've got the green, uh, which relates to the, uh, the AUP. Why would you be the uh, the local elders? Any kind of local mullers, anyone that's a, an influential player in the area that we want to know about. And then the red, which is uh, traditionally the, the insurgents. 
so anyone involved in the insurgent activity or that we deem to be Taliban would be up on the red board. The military we call it the intelligence cycle or the targeting cycle and it allows us to just chip away at the insurgents. It's unlike three years ago when ISAF were perhaps leaving a patrol base, they go into an area and poke the fire or kick the hornet's nest over. There's a contact, they win the firefight uh, and then they go home until the next day. Yeah, but what you're targeting is not necessarily the people on the ground that are pulling the triggers. What you're targeting are the facilitators, correct? Uh, absolutely, because we don't want to target the playground weaklings, if you like, because all we're going to do is piss off their family, their brothers, their cousins, their nephews and create, create more. even more insurgents. To find out how successful these new tactics are, I'm going on a patrol which has been tasked with gathering evidence on a Taliban suspect. Two days ago, as everyone's aware, we found a number of uh, IED component parts. This will be my first time outside the wire in over two and a half years. The main reason for going out on this patrol is to look out for a known layer of IEDs. Um, they know that he's in the vicinity and they know he's been operating in a certain area, so they're going to look for him while they're out on the ground. The main cause of coalition deaths in Afghanistan is the IED, or improvised explosive device. Generally, we hear about the fatalities. It's rarely reported when soldiers suffer life-changing injuries. Every time you read about a soldier that has died on the battlefield, more often than not, there are three or four others who have been seriously injured. I can't uh, say the, the amount of pain that I suffered that day. So huge, and I couldn't compare it with the, any other thing. It's hard not to think about an IED strike when you're writing your blood group down. The major fear for the lads is losing their limbs, or even worse, their balls. No one really likes to discuss the biggest killer out there. Our soldiers now have some of the best kit available. The protection it offers has improved significantly. Consequently, each man is carrying over 90 pounds, which in this heat is a backbreaker. As with the Osprey arm, which is used by the troops here, there are actually plates in the side here. Um, unfortunately, we know, you know too well that people aren't covered there, they can get killed. Um, also, notable difference is this time we're not wearing blue. Uh, big reason for that is, is that we know through intelligence um, that's been gathered over the last two, three years, that the Taliban now look to focus on cameramen and journalists in the field because they can use this as a sight line uh, in terms of if they can get us, get out, hit the guys in blue, they'll hit either us or something around us. So consequently, it makes us less of a target. We're now wearing a camouflage. Uh, one for Bravo, one for our Bravo. Leading the patrol is Colour Sergeant Dave Mason. Right, lads, that's us. Let's get ready to go. Leaving the safety of the base focuses the mind. For any one of these men, the next step they make could be their last. guys have to be on their guard from the minute or the second they leave the patrol base. Are you still walking along the edges of fields? Yeah, or yeah. through them. Preferably through them because it's harder to lay IEDs, yeah. yeah. The aim is obviously not to set patterns, that's, that's key to this. 
The man on point is responsible for guiding a safe path using an IED detector. However, the Taliban are constantly adapting their methods, making bombs out of plastic, using wooden pressure plates, or even hiding IEDs in trees or walls. Again, you know, the problem with roads like this, um, they either call them blacked roads generally in the army. A tarmac road is obviously a lot harder to lay an IED on than at a road like this, particularly when there's been rain and when the ground's soft. Very easy to dig this road up and put explosives underneath the surface. Seeing normal life in Afghanistan is reassuring, but I can't help reminding myself how different this is to when I was last here. I can tell you, it's now what, gone five, we've been on the ground for just over half an hour, and uh, it is absolutely boiling, it really is hot still. When you're walking through here, don't stand on any of the reeds that are laid down, just walk around. Around them, yeah, understood. Just approaching the uh, the house of the uh, suspect IED bomb maker, the place that he allegedly stores uh, the equipment he needs to make these uh, his improvised explosive devices. The plan is to identify the suspect and confirm where he is living. Salam alaikum. Where's the AUP? Last time I was here, the patrol would have forced their way in. Now, under I'm new speaking. rules set out by Karzai's government, NATO troops can't forcibly enter an Afghan home without substantial evidence. It's hoped that this softer approach will keep the local Afghans on side. Okay, right, then, unexpectedly, the suspect finds us rather than us finding him. There may be a possibility of uh, insurgents moving back into this area. Does he know anything about that? Just ask him uh, if it's possible um, when we go around we uh, take pictures of the local nationals uh, on our camera. Um, is he happy for me to take his picture? Yes. No, no, no. But it's not a straightforward photograph. This biometric camera maps the human face. It's a form of electronic fingerprinting which captures the individual and unique patterns of the human eye. Sergeant Mason and his men won't arrest this man until they have concrete evidence. Seems like a very nice ethical chap, but, you know, for all that, he still could be supporting an insurgent, or maybe he's just a simple farmer. And you know, presently, I don't think I could judge, I don't think anyone else can judge right now. I think the guys will have to go back, look at the information that they've gathered today and uh, pass it on to intelligence. But it backs up again what I was trying to say earlier, that the game has changed in terms of, you know, it's not as simple as just saying the enemy are over there, let's go out there and contact them, get into a fight and hopefully defeat them. It's, it's far more intelligence based, it's far more a policing role and even a detective's role rather than you know dropping 200 pound bombs on them which does no help in terms of the relationship between ISAF and the honest law-abiding decent citizens of Helmand province. This game of cat and mouse requires time and carries a high risk. 
but it won't be long until Whiskey's tactical patience pays off. I've been back in Afghanistan for little over a week. Nothing quite prepares you for life on the front line. The constant fear of IEDs and the extreme heat takes some getting used to. But slowly, I'm acclimatizing to life with 4-5 Commander. very well looked after by Whiskey Company and they particularly gave us the uh, ISO that cools the water. It also has a fan that directs hot air into our grot. And this is where we all are, over here. Jonathan, our cameraman, works on this with the director, Southern. Obviously, it's very windy here, so a lot of dust comes through here. We obviously use cameras like this, which we can attach to people. Uh, we also have two of these cameras and the very big one that's filming on me right now. The one thing that cameras really, really never actually show is just how hot it is. Um, temperature in here at 1 p.m. yesterday was around about 110, 111 Fahrenheit, which is around about 43, 44 Celsius. It's quite hot, and that's in the shade. Here's a new piece of kit, I think. Um, it's, it's invaluable out on the, uh, out on the ground. Uh, it's actually called a ballistic nappy. Um, I'm sure these will be being worn in certain clubs by the end of the year and nothing else on. But basically, get it around the right way. It fits on your belt buckle here, tucks up through, you strap it round, and obviously it protects the family jewels. And a lot of guys who have actually been hit by IEDs have actually managed to save their most vital piece of equipment by wearing these. Whiskey Company is made up of 140 men and 1,000 tattoos. Amongst all these fighting men is one very brave woman. <laughs> a sergeant in the Royal Logistics Corps, 34-year-old Bonnie Dacre, is a member of the operational search team. On the ground. I'll, I'll go out with a search team and we segregate the females from the males because obviously they, the males don't like you basically seeing their females or any of our soldiers engaging with them apart from females. Absolutely. I mean, it, culturally, it's a definite no-no, isn't it? It's a definite no-no, yeah, completely. Uh, how do you find the women when you're out on the ground, the local women? How, how do they react to you? Because, you know, to all intents and purposes, you're dressed very much like, well, you are dressed yeah. exactly, you carry a weapon, you're dressed exactly like, like the Marines, aren't you? Yeah, exactly like. Um, I don't think they realise at first that you're a female until you say, you know, slam her, come, and it's... Well, what's that? You know, they get the vocal cords. They yeah, and then they, they pick up. And very often, if you, you're walking along and there is females about, they'll always cover their face. But you can always see them have a little piece of say, was that a female I've just seen there? Or heard. Yeah. And how do they react to being um, searched? They giggle. <laughs> it's, it's totally alien to you then. They, they just look at you and say, what are you doing to me? Well, but they, they're quite good. Um, I, f I think they've, they've seen it a few times with the males. Do your family know exactly what you're doing out here? Yeah. Um, came a bit of a shock to them, but yeah, they do. Um, my grandma thought I was going to be in an office for the whole tour. Yeah. She was a bit shocked at that. She was a bit like, OK, I thought you was going to be in an office. I was like, ah, no, sorry. Well, they're proud of you, yeah? Oh, yeah, I should hope so. Every week, the Major holds a Shura where he meets with local Afghans. However, news has just come in that an informer wants to speak to him. It's thought that he has high-level intelligence on the Taliban. So it's decided to keep the meeting in place in the hope that the informer makes contact. Twenty minutes up the road from Katina is a town that has a reputation for Taliban activity. As we arrive in Zargan Calais, Major Maynard makes an impromptu decision to patrol the market. 
to show the locals that the Marines are here and ready to protect them. About eight months ago, this whole area was a battlefield fought pretty harshly between 16 Brigade, one Royal Irish and, uh, and the Taliban. So it was actually where we are right now? It's yeah. just the King uh, they, they were contacts every day. Uh, in fact, uh, just down here on the left, you see the school that was blown up. Uh, in fact, this, this school has been bombed twice. And the Taliban killed it because it was uh, symbolic of the government's progress here because of the school. Uh, there was girls coming to it. It was showing progress. And uh, uh, in the inimitable way, uh, they decided to blow it up. So every yeah. time it's been rebuilt, they've come back and blown it up? Yeah. No children were killed in either blast. But the Taliban didn't stop there. They intimidated the teachers with threats that acid would be thrown in their faces. They then went one step further. And why do you think they killed the teacher? Okay. So how do you feel about the people that destroyed the school? Well, I hope your school is rebuilt very soon. Yeah. I think you should become the new economic minister for the government of Afghanistan. Like, if you were there, would you keep the money or would you build schools? This is a 12-year-old. He's probably got a pretty good grasp of... <laughs> of the economics of this country presently. Now, that's a kind of sweeping statement for me to make, and I can't back it up. But, you know, this is what young people on the ground think about the schools being built here. The problem is, if all the sacrifices that have been made here are to mean something, then the Afghans have got to build these schools for the, for the future of their country, and they've got to stop putting the money in their back pockets, because that's a general consensus of the people here right now. <laughs> The Shura is being held at the heavily guarded police station. These gatherings are important for the locals and the district councillors to discuss problems and issues that affect them. For the Major, it's an opportunity to make progress and gather intelligence. But the threat of the Taliban is never far away. It's not uncommon for insurgents to infiltrate these meetings to try and find out who's collaborating with ISAF, so there's always a fair amount of apprehension. I will relentlessly pursue the insurgent for as long as I am here, but I am better able to do that with your help and your support. If those that want to see progress, if those that want to see stability and security all come together, then the insurgency has no room to move. This is the first time that I've come to this area. Um, and so I'd like to ask them a question. Um, what do they think will happen when the ISAF forces go? The insurgents will attack again. Yeah. The insurgents will attack again, eh? Attack again and they will take over. Just as we leave the Shura, the Major is told that the informant has arrived. We're going to have a one-on-one uh, -on -one now. This person is risking his life and his family's. The Taliban would not hesitate to torture and kill anyone helping ISAF. The informer seems to have credible information on a high-level Taliban commander spying on the base at Katina. How many insurgents? Uh, two, no, far away. Yeah, two, two, like, uh, two bodyguards. Like. He was outside Katina? Yes, he was just checking. ISAF locations. ISAF locations. 
then there was more troubling news. So he's training men specifically in this area for yeah, suicide? Yeah, some yeah, like young boys. Do you think they're going to target Zagan Kalei? Yes, they are coming to Zagan Kalei area. The informant has provided valuable intelligence. Not only is the base at Katina being watched, but suicide bombers are being trained in the area. The information gathered is of such significance that Whiskey Company are about to mount a daring operation. Whiskey Company are planning a covert raid based on information from an informant. Their target is a man who trains suicide bombers. My intent is to conduct a covert insertion into the area of interest early hours tomorrow morning. We will quickly establish a layered cordon around these four compounds here, compound 10, 14, 8 and 13, with 10 being the primary compound of interest. Just remember the Bravo, Bravo 1 is a suspect suicide IED facilitator and therefore we will be looking for components associated with that type of threat. Key personnel run through the logistics of the operation so that they can brief their individual teams later. As of now, the whole of Whiskey Company is on standby. Deliberately picked a route that avoids as far as possible uh, any compounds and calais for the sole purpose of avoiding the dogs uh, giving away opposition as much as possible. We'll be fighting from the door, nice and slow and laborious. It's not going to be a quick task, but make no mistake, if it goes compound red, we're going to be on the back foot initially until that Bravo call sign punch in there and fight through. This is a bloke that trained 15 and 16-year-old boys last summer to blow themselves up and kill innocent people. Let's make sure he doesn't get the chance to do it again this year. Thanks. The operation will be carried out tonight under the cover of darkness. Sky, getting that wagon now, mate. You and Scout, mount up. All right, uh, I've just been given an early go ahead for Operation Tora Basha 43. Going to be moving vehicles now down to a certain point as quietly as possible into a layup position. They know that this guy has been training young men to become suicide bombers. He was doing it all last year. They suspect they've found the location that he's living in. Once they find him and they either find incriminating evidence or they find explosives on his person, uh, they're going to lift him and uh, take him to Bastion. Before that happens, we've got a very long night ahead of us. Any suspect arrested will be interrogated by British forces before being handed over to the Afghan authorities. Operation Tora Basha, which means Courageous Hawk, is underway. vehicles moving at night because we're moving near the whole of Whiskey Company. That's going to cause people to start talking, either I can chat out or telephone calls will be made because it's rare that this many vehicles will be moving at night. With such a large troop movement, the Major has devised a plan so as not to alert the suspect, codename Bravo. Whiskey Company will rendezvous at a police checkpoint, well away from the target. Here, they will then wait until the early hours of the morning before setting off to surround the suspect's compound. Then, on the call sign Bunker Hill, they will go in. It's 03.30 and everyone has made it to the rendezvous point without a hitch. The 
things that we're fighting against are there are farmers out in the fields this time of night. Uh, there are members of the Afghan National Police that might be less than sympathetic to our objective. And also, nearly every compound in Afghanistan has a dog. And uh, they'll smell us and they'll hear us coming and start barking. And that could alert the Bravo to um, our approach. Whiskey Company now separate into three units, each one taking different routes to the suspect's compound. It's over a mile through rough terrain. The possibility of an IED strike at night is omnipresent. The Marines have night vision, and so does the camera. However, I'm not so fortunate. Once again, the man on point sweeps a path, laying down glowing markers as he goes. So basically, the side limbs the guys are dropping us so the guys behind us can see the right way because it's been cleared by the guy up front. I'm trying to walk in the footsteps of the man in front of me as I'm terrified of straying outside the safety zone. The dogs in the surrounding compounds sense our presence. There's a real risk of alerting the Taliban and our suspect. The question uh, that we stay here up until the uh, moment that you want us to move into the cordon, over. After an anxious 25 minutes and wondering if our cover has been blown, we stand by for the call sign to go in. We've got phone now. We've been joined by other members of Whiskey Company. The compound is just over there. However, the dog is still barking in that compound because it's sensing the whiskey company is slowly surrounding that compound and hopefully causing a net so the suspect can't escape. Charlie Charlie 1, Charlie Charlie 1, zero Alpha at Bunker Hill, Bunker Hill at 1113, one, one, over. Okay, Bunker Hill is the course to move in. Here we go. 